truth. I'm 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 forbidden truth. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. On this week's episode, I'll be speaking with convicted murderer Joseph Roach. Joseph Roach has a lengthy arrest record. He's been arrested and convicted of operating a vehicle while intoxicated, battery, criminal trespass, failure to comply with a court order, disorderly conduct times two, possession of marijuana, dangerous drug possession, aggravated driving under the influence, dangerous drug violation, possession of methamphetamine, battery against a household member, and possession of cocaine times two. Joseph brutally beat a man over and over with a metal handrail so he could rob him so he and his girlfriend could buy some crack. After the couple returned to the spot that Joe had beat the man over and over, they had found that he was still breathing. Joe took out a hammer and hit him over and over, repeatedly hitting his skull, putting his body in the cabinet, and three days later he put a body in a trash can. Joseph was later arrested, charged, and convicted of murder, receiving a 65-year prison sentence. Here's my interview with convicted murderer Joseph Roach. Hello, this is a free call from... Joseph Roach. An inmate at the Indiana State Prison. Let's start off with talking about your childhood. Where were you born? Uh, I was born at St. Joseph's Hospital in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Do you remember your first positive memory as a child? First positive memory. Um, I could just remember my grandparents, my grandma and grandpa, my step grandfather, and uh, I was around them quite a bit or left at their house. What about your first negative memory as a child? Uh, first negative memory, I would say um, being around my mother and uh, when she was a stripper. Uh, people abusing her, beating her, or uh, sexually doing things to her when I'd be in the other room or in the room, the same room, when she was under the influence or they were both under the influence. Would these be like sexual assaults or would it be like consensual sex just in front of you? Yeah. Did you ever let your mom know that you didn't appreciate that or it made you feel uncomfortable? No, uh, I learned to be real quiet because of a lot of physical and psychological abuse that took place. Uh, there would be times she would leave me for two, three days and would not be around. And her her uh, lovers or the drug lords that she used to date would be physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually abusive to me. Really bad to the point where my ears would bleed and I'd hide under the bed. Can you go into depth about any of the abuse? Um, there was a time with uh, a guy named George Fontana that she used to date. I actually thought he was my father, and uh, when she wasn't around, him and his boy would uh, either uh, beat me physically or with a ball bat or at bricks at one time. And it created a lot of uh, fear and insecurity and unsafety. I would wake up and my mom did a lot of dresses for strippers and there would be times I'd wake up and my underwear would be down to my ankles and not know how that happened. I don't know what happened or what took place, but since I've been in recovery, I shared that with my mother and she kind of got a pinch and thought I was accusing her and I said, I wasn't accusing you, but I've been doing a lot of soul searching because I never want to pick up drugs and alcohol again. And I said, in the process of that, I need to know what the root cause is of you know looking deep in my life why what manifested these behaviors and these fears and stuff in me and i'm trying to understand it so i can be i can be better you know what i mean i can be better physically mentally emotionally and spiritually in my life and find some wholeness and healing what was your household like growing up i know you mentioned that you live with your mom did you ever live with your father throughout your childhood no, I didn't meet my, meet my father until I was 10 and a half and I was dropped off at his doorstep. And uh, when I'd opened the door, there was a, a blonde woman and a little blonde kid that he had had another wife and another uh, little boy with this woman. So uh, 
at that time, I really just didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And that was about at 10 and a half that that happened. What was life like at your dad's house? Did you suffer any abuse there? My dad was a practicing alcoholic addict. And uh, at that time, um, he was verbally abusive quite a bit. And then when, because uh, around that time, I never really seen much of him except for a couple years later. And then I was introduced to other members of the family on that side that I didn't even know that I had family on. Have you been diagnosed with any mental illnesses? Yes, I was. Post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome and an anxiety disorder. And uh, I had a lifelong uh, drug and alcohol addiction issues. And uh, until the last, well, October 31st would be nine years after I uh, rededicated my life to Jesus Christ and I've been set free ever since then. What drugs were you using when you were addicted? Uh, well, at first, when I was younger, I was forced to drink and smoke weed. Uh, I got a picture that I have that I'm probably about six or seven years old. Uh, I was smoking hash with my mother on a needle. Um, then I was around her doing quaaludes. I never did the quaaludes, but as a young teenager, I got involved in acid, drinking, and smoking a lot of weed. And then that kind of gradually went into other things. When uh, the other stuff just quit working for me, that's when I got into a uh, deeper usage of addiction. Did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? Uh, when I was 10 and a half, um, I traded a mini bike for like 11 trash bags of homegrown marijuana. And then I did school one day with a friend of mine I grew up with. And uh, me and him uh, did school with these two girls and then... The next day we uh, did school again and ended up, I stole a compound bow and some arrows and he stole like an AK-47 and I got put on probation for breaking and entering mm. and I was at 10 and a half at that time. After that, um, probably within a couple years after that, my addiction got a lot worse. Uh, I was... Uh, pretty much left alone on the streets a lot at my grandmother's. Uh, my grandmother financially enabled me and kept me in and gave me a lot of money. She never basically denied me nothing. Well, I'd hung out with my uh, cousin one night and went to go get some weed and somebody laced it with angel dust. And, uh, I got left on the sidewalk pretty much naked out in winter time. My grandmother came out and got me and uh, I was just really rebellious at that time. Uh, by the time I was uh, 13, my mom moved me out to Blythe, Aaronsburg, or Blythe, California, in Aaronsburg, Arizona. I was out there for a while, and uh, she divorced him, and then she met another guy that moved me to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, during this time period, she was also dating drug lords, and I was moved every three to six months of my life at that time. So... Uh, at that time, uh, I didn't have any stability. Um, there was constant movement. Today, I understand because of the fear of what they were doing, the type of lifestyle that they were doing to support themselves. They thought they was being watched and this and that. So uh, anyhow, I uh, the last time my mom moved me to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, I didn't make it in a freshman. I got kicked out for selling marijuana over at the uh, Burger King and Pretty much after that, I got a job at the car wash and moved in with the elderly guy that I met through, I don't know where I met him, but him and my mom was friends and uh, I moved in with him and had my own apartment at 14. And uh, at that time, I met somebody at car, uh, the car wash, which was uh, a woman down in Phoenix that was the trophy girl for the Phoenix, Arizona racetrack. And, uh, then she got pregnant and I had a daughter come into my life. Um, we both was into addiction real heavily. Um, then had a lot of problems with um, our relationship because of it. A lot of psychological abuse, verbal abuse, things that were, that I seen in my childhood or in my juvenile years around that happened to my mother. I thought that stuff was normal behavior. And then I started acting out and doing the same things that were 
that I've seen done to others. Um, and then during that time between the age of 14 and 15, maybe a little bit older, 16, I came back to Indianapolis and uh, I was living in a two-door citation and a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to come over for some hot dogs and some macaroni and cheese and it was winter time. And uh, next thing I know that I was drugged against my will and I couldn't move my body, I was paralyzed. And I just walked out of the house for four months. I didn't drink, eat or nothing, I just wanted to die. And then my addiction kept me and uh, put me a lot of, around a lot of other places and unsavory people that it ended up happening again by another male and then by two other females. And uh, then when I got married, uh, a lot of this behavior, learned behavior and dysfunctionalness that I was raised with came out of my wife and my addiction got even worse. Uh, I was in Phoenix and I got addicted to crack cocaine really bad, heroin and meth. Um, it ended up causing me to lose my wife because of my violence my behavior, my abusiveness. Uh, I thought by having relations with her during the day or being intimate with her is what I thought that how you showed love to a woman. At least that's what I thought that I knew that was normal that I seen going on in my mother's life and found out later that it wasn't. Um, so basically everything that I had to learn, I learned the hard way. Um, then my wife came back out to uh, Owen, County, Owen County, Spencer, Indiana. And um, my dad made me make a choice one night. We was about 60 miles away from the camp and he told me to leave my wife or my girlfriend at the time. I said, why don't you just leave her here? She don't love you. And at the time I wanted my father's acceptance. I agreed with it, and the next day it was like the worst thing I'd ever went through in my life. Uh, I felt really bad that next day her parents flew her back to Phoenix, and she took my uh, two-year-old at the time, and uh, I just felt really horrible about it. Right before all this happened, though, for about a month and a half, she kept begging me to do something. Uh, she got pregnant again and thought the only solution was trying to have a miscarriage. In the process of going through this, uh, I was working with my stepmom. She asked me to go uh, out in the woods one day with her and kept asking me to hit her in the stomach lightly. And I was totally against it. Then after about a month and a half and drinking and drugging and I got really tired of hearing it, I told her, let's go out in the woods and I'm gonna lightly hit you in the stomach and I don't wanna hear nothing else about it. Well, she went back to Phoenix, Arizona and she gave she gave birth to uh, my son, Joshua James Roach, and two hours after delivery, he died. Um, at that time, I was in the county jail. Um, I hated myself. I blamed myself for my son's death. I was in a six-man cell at that time with other inmates, and they pulled me out of the cell and put me in an isolated cell because they knew that my son had just died. The back of his brain wasn't fully developed, and... Uh, when they put me in this single cell, there was a Bible in there. I didn't know what it was about. Every, every hair on my head, on my arms and my neck stood up. And when I picked it up, it was John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes it shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I had a spiritual experience. Somebody came into that cell that day and put his arms around me and loved me and forgave me in a way that I've never experienced anything in my entire life. I didn't know nothing about God. I was raised around pagan and heathen uh, practices. You know, nobody, when I was younger, we'd go to church just to get out of the neighborhood, but I never had any personal experiences with a higher power or any of that. Anyhow, um, after I got out of the county jail, I fell back into a lot of my old ways. Uh, I went back out to Phoenix. They told me I could never see my wife and kid again. I pretty much left the state and uh, fleed from the law. Uh, I went out to Scottsdale, Arizona, where my son was buried, and it was pouring down rain one day. The clouds were really black, and uh, it was pouring down really bad, and I found where they had buried my son. And uh, all of a 
sudden I landed on my hands and knees and I just cried out to God to forgive me because I felt that it was my fault that he had died. Uh, as soon as I fell down and started praying, it stopped raining and it was like the heavens opened up and the clouds opened up right where I was at and the glory of heaven shined right down on me and took me up to heaven. In the process of this out-of-body experience, I see Jesus walking up to me and Jesus is holding this little boy's hand. Uh, I'm looking into the eyes of Jesus and Jesus is looking at me smiling. And this little boy let go of his hand and this little boy ran up to me. And when he came up to me, he said, Daddy, I love you and Mommy and I'm in here in heaven waiting for you. Uh, bear with me right now. It's a little uh, emotional for me to even talk about that. Uh, I don't think I'd ever been able to forgive myself if I didn't have this spiritual experience at the time. Um, after that, uh, I went to a halfway house. I was having these spiritual experiences with God over and over again. Um, one day, some man came into my life when I was at this halfway house and told me that I had to call in a King David in my life, and I had no idea what that meant. Uh, the next day, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I received this anointing and baptism in the Spirit. Next thing I knew, wherever the Holy Spirit led me was where I would go and do what God showed me to do. Um, in the process, I didn't understand being such a young baby Christian that there were other forces that was going to try to divert or deceive me from the calling and the gift that God had laid upon my life and the ministry that he had called me to. So uh, I got involved in an uh, unmarried relationship. Anyhow, after I got involved with that, um, I went up to, um, felt led to go into the desert. And I went up, ended up in Payson, Arizona. And uh, I was up there going to church. And I was asked to be part of this play for the Easter Sunday. And I had tattoos all over me and a bunch of scars. So the, the Christian woman put makeup and they put this cotton string diaper around me. And my part in the play was, if you're the Messiah, save yourself and us. Uh, I thought that I needed to have a marriage or a woman in my life at the time to complete me. Um, at that time, uh, during the play, I played uh, Wednesday in front of like 2,500 people. On that Friday, I'd asked my uh, fiance, her mom and her stepdad, if I could have her hand in marriage. Uh, I got up on the cross and played in that play. When I looked down in the crowd, there was another man's arm around my fiance. Uh, as soon as I got out, uh, I was the type of alcoholic and addict that would just self-sabotage. Um, next thing I know, I, uh, I basically got into a self-destructive mode, woke up the next day in the passenger seat of my car in a puddle of puke with this stranger that I didn't even know at this drug dealer's house out in the middle of the desert. And I just cried out to God and asked God to forgive me and that if he could get me back up on back up to Pace in Arizona that I would hang up on that cross for Easter Sunday for him. And it happened. And um, after that, I got into this tailspin and got even deeper into my addiction. Um, I started to get more violent in other relationships that I was in. I became very uh, hurtful physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, I got involved in the needles. So I started selling meth really bad up in Payson, Arizona and backslid back into my addiction. Uh, I got really violent with a woman that I was involved with. Uh, she backhanded me going down to Phoenix one time trying to get some drugs. Um, when I came to out of a blackout, I was in her car parked behind a building and there was nothing but blood just splattered everywhere. And uh, I actually thought that I had hit her or did something. Um, I was kind of really freaked out about the whole thing. Um, she wasn't nowhere to be found. Uh, I remember bits and uh, pieces of that night, her hitting me in the mouth, and I remember grabbing my gun, hitting her in the head or doing something and dragging her through the park. Uh, 
at that time I would black out in my addiction really bad and do things that I wouldn't even remember doing. Uh, this was down in Phoenix where it happened. I drove 120 miles in her car and got back up to Hayson, Arizona. And uh, I went to the house, she wasn't there. I was told by the neighbors that she went into the hospital. I went up to the hospital and found out she had just had 120 stitches put in her head from where I had reacted to her hitting me in the mouth that night being under the influence. Uh, the doctor chewed me out. He was disgusted with me, couldn't believe that I had had anything to do with that, that I wasn't that type of person. Uh, I felt so bad that I went to the police station in Payson, Arizona and turned myself in and told them detail for detail everything that happened and they went to arrest me. Uh, I went back to the house and she was there and begged her forgiveness and told her that would have never happened again and uh, my addiction kept getting worse and worse and finally I just had to separate myself from her and her kids because I was afraid something bad was going to eventually happen if I didn't get away from them because of me being so sick and blacking out and doing things and not knowing what I was doing was really starting to scare the hell out of me. Um, then I went back down to Phoenix, Arizona and I became homeless, eating out of dumpsters, trash cans, uh, anything to support my crack habit or meth habit. Uh, uh, I came back to Indianapolis, did the same thing here through homelessness, uh, had a sugar mama that was buying me dope and drugs for sexual favors with her. Um, and then things just kept getting worse. And then I went back to Phoenix and then came back again. And that's when I was living with my grandmother and the neighborhood that I'm from, uh, I think every other house had a drug dealer in it. So, uh, when I caught the case that got me here, I was in and out of the courts, struggle with drug and alcohol addiction, trying to get help. I even went to the point that my mother had me to try to lie to the probation department to uh, to say that I was losing my mind and crazy to see if they would even give me help, but I couldn't get help nowhere because I didn't have insurance and I didn't have no money. Um, I was at Volunteers of America and somebody offered to sell me a motorcycle. My grandmother loaned me 500 bucks and I ended up the guy disappeared that was going to sell me the motorcycle. Uh, I had the $500 in my pocket and I got sick and I knew that I wasn't feeling too good, but I used it as an excuse to go over to Wishard Hospital. Uh, when I got there, I knew that if I called Volunteers of America that they would know that I was at the hospital in the emergency center. So when I got there and called them uh, shortly after I called the dope man and was running around the hospital in and out of the bathroom smoking crack and then hallucinating thinking the security was going to catch me and I ended up relapsing with this female and the female is the one that I caught this case over. Um, I was sent to my grandmother's house on probation. Uh, my addiction got so out of hand that I was not sleeping. Uh, I think I was up for almost four months straight just nodding off and being back up. That's how insane my disease, my mental mental illness was at the time. Uh, then I found out that she was a prostitute and then being on house arrest, uh, I took advantage of that. And uh, she started going out pulling tricks for drugs. Uh, she asked if a guy can come over one night to get us high and I said, sure, as long as he's bringing some dope. He comes over that night and it takes him about four or five hours to make it four or five blocks away. Uh, he was really drunk that night. I called my best friend when he got over because he wanted some beer and some cigarettes. And my best friend, Robert McDaniels, comes over and goes buys him some uh, beer and some cigarettes. Well, me and my best friend's out in the garage smoking some crack. And um, Sherry and this other guy's in the basement. Well, I just got done getting high and hitting the pipe and I left my friend, my best friend in the garage and I walked down the driveway of my grandmother's driveway. Well, there's three basement windows and two of them's got blankets hanging up over them, but the windows open and I get, I make it to the very last window and I put my ear down to the window and I hear her saying, 
I need to hide this ten dollars from Jojo real quick so he don't find out. And I got furious. And I'm thinking, well, what the hell is she down there doing? And then the first thing I thought of, because she didn't have no money, that she was trying to pull a trick behind my back. And I just overheard it. I come down in the basement. Uh, she's wiping her mouthpiece, zipping the zipper, and I just flipped out. I went crazy and uh, beat the dude to death, and the dude died on me. Uh, the autopsy said over 350 skull fractures, where um, since I've been in prison and had to deal with that and really take a good look, why did these things happen in my life? Uh, I've been in and out of recovery for a long time. My mom's got like 45 or 50 years now. Uh, gave her life to Jesus, and here I was backslidden and got caught up in all this insanity and then catch a 65 year bit in my grandmother's case on house arrest uh, i went to court introduced the insanity plea you know i was under the influence uh, there was so much deception and lying going on that sherry started telling uh the, the detectives that this was a premeditated murder robbery out of her own story um uh, my father told me when I'd called home collect my mom and my stepdad I mean my my real father and my stepmother was sitting behind the prosecutor and my public defender and the public defender sold me out to a hired client and the prosecutor wanted my case so she could find me guilty regardless of what the truth and the facts was so she could use my high profile case to be reelected on when my father told me that when I went to trial on my case, I exercised my Fifth Amendment. I tried to get a change of a uh, public defender. Uh, I was never offered a plea bargain. Uh, when I went to court, I just remained silent through my whole case because anything that I say could and would be used against me. I was petrified, full of fear, and had a nervous breakdown after this whole thing happened before I was arrested. Uh, the individual that passed away was on the premises of my grandmother's property for about seven days. Uh, I tried to get it off the property. I couldn't. Within those days, I went through like $1,200 in dope, and I was just losing my mind because now here I am in a situation that I don't know how to deal with. You said that he was in the house for almost a week. Where did you store his body? He was in the basement, and I pulled him out and dragged him and put him in a blanket into the garage underneath the workbench and uh that's when after two days later uh i was just so intoxicated un under the influence of dope uh there wasn't no door lock on the garage i'm hearing things i'm hallucinating i'm thinking this dude's gonna come back to life and kill me i mean i'm really waking out freaking out being under the influence of these drugs now I'm in a situation, I don't know what to do. Uh, I found this plastic trash can, I got him in it, and he was upside down, and then uh, my best friend come back over. He said, well, what ever happened to that guy? Because he was there the night when this happened. I come back out of the basement after I did what I did, and I told him, I said, Bobby, I think that I just killed this guy. I walked in on him getting his dick sucked by the old lady. And I said, I flipped out on this dude. And I said, I think I just killed this guy. Well, it scared him and he left that night. Well, seven days later, he comes back wanting me to get him some drugs, right? And uh, he's like, well, what happened, dude? And I lied to him. I said, well, dude got up and he, he took off. I didn't tell him he was, in, he was under the workbench at that time. Anyhow, when uh, about an hour or two after we just get time, I'm like, Bobby, I've got myself into a situation. I've done something, and I don't know how to get out of it. I need your help to try to get this off the property. I was trying to cover up my tracks of the shame and the guilt of what I did. Anyhow, he went and told an off-duty off officer over at, uh, you know, where Central State is in Indianapolis. It's an old mental ward. It's a police academy now. Anyhow, him and his parents and his sister's boyfriend that just got out of prison from being up here went and told him to go talk to this off-duty off officer to, to let them know what I had just asked him to do. And uh, then the cops came over. 
Uh, I seen a detective drive down the back alley and I already knew what time it was. I went and laid down on the bed. Sharon was in there and I laid down next to her and told her, hey, I just seen a detective. I said, it's over with. I said, they're going to be in here to pick us up. And uh, I said, uh, I think my friend just went to the police and uh, turned me in. And uh, we got arrested. And one of the officers that arrested her was one of the officers she showed her tits and her vagina to uh, one night to get out because she had a syringe full of dope and a crack pipe. And she showed her vagina and her uh, titties to him, and he handcuffed her down at the 7-Eleven one night. So as soon as I seen him come in and handcuffed her and knew about the situation, I knew that I just already knew it was over with. Uh, they put me in the county jail. Uh, they asked me my side of the story. I really didn't say much. They was going by whatever it was that she was telling them. And then she manufactured up this whole thing that this was a premeditated murder robbery and that we planned this. Well, I had access to money with my best friend and my grandmother. This was never about money. She's the one that, uh, during my trial, she confessed to the jury that she was hiding the $10 from me, but her beginning sentence was that we planned this together for this to happen, and then she tells the courts that I knew that she had been tricking with this guy and that she told me all about it. Well, I didn't know that she had ever had sex with this guy, and I never knew anything about any of that that insanity if i would have known that i wouldn't even have never let the dude down in the basement get alone in my grandmother's house um, i got in the county jail and i think i slept for two or three weeks straight um somebody from the second pier threw a mattress down and i didn't even phase me that's how out of it i was because i'd been up and sick under the influence of drugs and alcohol for so long um, when i went to trial I remained silent. Um, two weeks before my trial, my grandmother left the prosecutor down in the basement. Uh, the prosecutor lied and manufactured all these lies about what happened that night, how it happened, that uh, I planned this and that me and her planned to rob him of some money. And uh, there wasn't much I can say or do about it. I didn't have a lawyer. Okay, then when I went to sentencing in the court, uh, before I went to sentencing, the prosecutor during the trial manufactured this whole story that this is what happened, that's what happened, this happened, trying to go off of this deception of lies that Sharon West was saying that happened about the whole situation. Um, the night that this happened, uh, I knew that she had had the $10 because I overheard that. I tied the phone wires off that night. Uh, went up to BP to get a pack of cigarettes and she went and got a dime of dope. We went back into the garage and smoked that up and about an hour later she pulls out about $60, $70 worth of crack cocaine. And I asked her, I said, well, where did you get that at? You didn't have no money. And I said, the only money I was aware of of what I overheard you say that you just got. She said, well, oh, after you beat the guy up, I got in his pants and I robbed him. And uh, I went and bought some drugs with it when you was at the 7-Eleven going to get cigarettes. So here now I got in this situation. I go to court, she manufactures all this lies and stuff, and I'm not saying that at all, that I didn't have my part to play in through my insanity. Um, when I go to court and go to trial, the prosecutor said that I used a hammer and a handrail in the case. Those items were never even used in my, my case at all. They were all manufactured lies to find me guilty regardless of what the truth and the facts were in my case. Um, when I went to sentencing on my sentencing date, which was after my trial, they found me guilty of second degree murder. They dropped a robbery because she confessed that she was hiding the $10 from me. But she made them think that I knew this guy when I didn't even know this guy. So basically what I reacted on, I reacted on her doing something with another individual when I was emotionally involved with the woman. Anyhow, all that did come out in trial. On sentencing day, they asked me if I had anything to say. And I, I said, uh, I told the family, I'm, I was so angry and pissed about everything. I was wanting the truth of the whole situation to come out, but it didn't happen like that. And I told the family, I'm sorry, I found your son's cock in my old lady's mouth, and I reacted to it. 
I said, I am responsible for what I did. I can't change them. And I left it at that. Uh, I was sentenced to 65 years. I was never even offered a plea bargain. Uh, they maxed me out. Uh, I was sentenced down to Pendleton. Uh, then I was sent up here to ISP. And I was at a Cairo's. Uh, I was, well, my drug and alcohol addiction even got worse after I got to prison. I went through about seventy to $90,000 from 2007 to 2010 in here. Uh, I OD'd a couple times. I've died seven different times in my life. Uh, I went to this thing called Kairos, which was a Christian retreat. Uh, I rededicated my life back to the Lord. Uh, and ever since then, I've never picked up a drink, a drug, a drink or a or tobacco, and I try to help other people uh, have a relationship with Christ and express what he did for me in my life. And what brought a lot of the healing about, see, I could never figure it out that I'd relapsed so many different times. I only made it twice in my life when I was younger, up to a year and a half of recovery time. Uh, what happened was, was the things that happened to me when I was drugged and raped and molested against my will by two different men and two different women. And I guess the side effects of my mother trying to stab me to death with scissors when I ran into the bathroom when I was a young boy. Um, then being at her lover's house, I was at one of her lover's houses and uh, two bikers came out, killed everybody. I crawled through the body parts of that. And then two weeks later, they bombed his his uh his uh wife his ex-wife's house up after that i lived with my grandmother um going through all this and looking down at the deep roots i had to take a knife and cut open a lot of these wounds in my childhood i was so sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired um i just cried out and asked god to help me and why do i keep doing this stuff i asked for honesty to do with what I needed to deal with and the courage to live within myself so I would never hurt another human being or myself or my loved ones ever again. Um, shortly after I dedicated my life to Christ, I loaned a man in here $51. Two weeks later, he came and stabbed me 30 times in my sleep. Um, since then, I've been prosecuted many other times for being a follower of Jesus Christ in here. And right before I came to the phone, uh, I was almost prosecuted again several different times within this last two weeks before giving you this testimony how uh, Jesus Christ changed my life and has given me hope and a future today. And I just try to carry the message with other alcoholics and addicts and uh, I'm basically the face of recovery on this journey when it comes to everybody dealing with drug and alcohol addiction. Now. Mm. You've been incarcerated for a while now. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis to keep yourself occupied? Uh, right now, I just got moved into RWI, which is a recovery while incarcerated. Uh, I needed the time cut. Uh, right now, I had to file a lawsuit because I was a witness to a man sexually molested an inmate back at my last job. So I lost my job that I worked really hard to get to. Then I lost my honor dorm housing. Uh, I put 4,000 hours in on this apprenticeship. I tried to better myself in my job at Penn Products. I got a housekeeping apprenticeship. I was in Grace College and then they took state funding away. So uh, uh, six more months, I could get my associates. Uh, the six months before I could have got my associates is when I got stabbed and I lost the use of my right hand I got permanent nerve damage now for the rest of my life from the stabbing from the inmate to stab me over an e dorm at uh, 3 30 in the morning uh, since then I uh, volunteered uh, suicide companion I work with the mentally ill through the snap program uh, I uh, would hold AA and NA meetings and I would share with other people and other inmates how God changed my life and what it took for me to go through and how I had OD'd and died several different times in my life and that I'm a walking miracle today. Uh, I went to Penn Products. I successfully completed uh, industrial maintenance and utility worker back there. Uh, 
they owe me a certificate, a six month time cut, and a DOP, which is a dark Department of Labor certificate for being a machinist, welder, and metal fabricator, right? Because of what I witnessed, they, the bosses that were back there were trying to keep me from getting my time cut. So I just filed a lawsuit on that, trying to get my time cuts on all that. And the guy that I walked in on, he got fired 30 days later. And then the other boss recently just got fired at Pin Products that was refusing to give me my time cut. So now I put myself in RWI and trying to get a time cut, six month time cut on that and trying to be open-minded to see if there's anything else that I can still learn. In the process, I'm supporting the newcomers back here that are practicing alcoholics and addicts right now with this new synthetic drugs that are in here. That it's, it's just really off the wall in here with this retinol and this heroin and this new synthetic stuff that they spray on tea bags and smoke, right? And uh, I just got back here and started this program and uh, I got a strong Christian community I go to Orthodox Christian meetings, and then I uh, we have our own church among the inmates back here and share testimonies how God has set us free from drugs and alcohol or just share about what God did for us in our lives and pretty much what I'm doing with you right now, but not so much detail. Hmm. And that uh, I couldn't do this alone, that it took, it took the power of God and somebody greater than me to do for me on a daily basis. And uh, in the morning, I spend time of prayer and meditation and ask God to keep me clean and sober for another 24 hours. And I have so many 24 hours now that October 31st would be nine years that God has completely and totally set me free. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered yet? I think a lot of uh, I'd like to share is the abusiveness and what happened to me. I've had to really take a lot of soul, soul searching. When I got here, being a Christian and then having God in my life, a backslidden, I had a really hard time forgiving myself of that. And then not only that, but knowing that I took another man's life. And what hurt the most out of all of it was that the truth of the whole situation wasn't expressed to his family. They took the testimony of a prostitute that was under the influence of drugs and alcohol that had her own agenda to get more dope where I had access to money with my grandmother and my friends if I ever needed to borrow something. I didn't have to go rob somebody. I had access and I was a master mechanic where I had I had people coming over working on cars and that's how I supported a lot of my drug addiction because I would work on drug dealers cars and I was really good at it and uh, just a lot of the insanity that when I got here you know it took me five years to forgive myself for taking this man's life and really taking a good look at my life and my higher power showing me how my disease and drug and alcohol addiction affected not only was I affected by my mother's addiction and my father's addiction but I believe this is genetically passed down in the family generation, right? And uh, just doing a lot of soul searching so it would never happen again that I would never hurt another human being ever in any way. And then when I looked at the outburst of how that happened and when it happened, I had all this other pain and all this other brokenness that if I, if I would have only dealt I knew how to handle getting healing on those inner wounds before all this happened. That man could have been still alive today, but uh, I think this is all that was part of God's plan for my life. And, you know, here I got a 65 year bit and I don't know how to study the law that well. I'm not good at it. Uh, the money that I went through since I've been here, I could have bought a lawyer, but I foolishly did that. But, I have hope today that I believe that God will give me grace and show me some mercy and uh, that my story and my experiences might help just one person out there to give their life over to God that, you know, trying to do it your way don't work. You know, self-will run riot, being so de uh, self-destructive. And then the most of it is that I heard that the guy that, that died in my case was a mechanic as well. And I've really had the view of how 
not only me being absent from my family and loved ones, but how his gifts and talents were used to help his loved ones out and them not having that today because of my actions and not knowing how to be honest about what happened to me in my childhood. I didn't know how to deal with them. I dealt with so much psychological, mental, and emotional abuse that once I was molested and then drugged and raped by two different men and two different women, all I cared about was covering the pain and hiding from it. I didn't know how to deal with it. And today, God's given me spiritual tools how to deal with life on life's terms today. And uh, I don't have to pick up a drink and drum. And that's the miracle of it. The obsession and compulsion in my life has been removed. But if I don't maintain a certain spiritual principles and by staying prayed up and spending time of prayer and meditation and asking the Holy Spirit to help me with things on a daily basis that I can go right back into those old behaviors. That was my interview with convicted murderer Joseph Roach. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden truth. I'm, 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 Unforbidden truth. Truth. I'm for the podcast.